Okay. Everyone back? Everyone ready? Okay, cool. So uh, this is going to be about EmberConf. We, we both were lucky enough to go, and it's also going to be about what's going on with Ember right now, because when I first started coming to these, uh, the, the guys who are hosting them used to regularly go through what happened in the month past, and we haven't gotten into the habit of doing that here yet, but it's quite a useful thing, and a lot has been happening the past few months. So, EmberConf was pretty big. It was a lot, a lot, a lot of fun. I think it was 430 attendees or something like that. Yeah. Um, it was at this sort of fancy hotel called The Nines in downtown Portland. Uh, this is the conference room. It was a single track thing, which was cool because uh, I don't know if I would have been able to divide my attention between all the talks. Um, and I don't know about you, but like to me, it felt like a real family atmosphere. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. For me as well. Like everybody was so friendly, like welcoming, it was very you know warm. Yeah, yeah. So um, all the videos are up now, by the way. I think well, almost all of them at least. They're, they're trickling out and the slides seem to be all out as well. So I'll introduce the two of us who are talking, or at least we'll introduce ourselves. And um, say if you want to introduce yourself yeah. first. Uh, yeah, sure. I'm Matteo De Palo. I'm um, a web developer working for Alpha Sites. It's a company based in London, Mayfair. And uh, we're mainly a ra Rails shop where we're trying to, to do more Ember, hopefully in the future. And uh, uh, they were kind enough to send me to the very hipster city <laughs> for uh, for uh, for EmberConf, uh, which for me was an amazing experience. Um, yeah, that's that's all it. That's cool. And uh, I'm Jamie. Uh, I work for a small tech consultancy called With Associates, based in East London. And similarly, I was luckily enough lucky enough to get sponsored to go to Portland for EmberConf. Um, I think my involvement with these meetups and with the London community kind of made it a no-brainer for the for our company to like figure it was worthwhile to send me out there and meet some people get some business cards so um, to start to to try and cover EmberConf I'm just going to kind of put some themes up and then we're going to try and riff on those themes and like our takeaways from what we saw and what we heard and everything else and then following EmberConf I'm going to plow through a load of slides about the stuff that's going on in Ember at the moment and what's worth paying attention to. And if I make a mistake, shout. If there's anything I don't mention, shout. And if you want to ask questions in between topics, then please shout as well. So the first one is community and values. Um, I thought maybe if we start with like the keynote and the things that Tom and Yehuda said in that. Yeah, uh, yeah well, they started, uh, Tom and Yehuda, they started by you know, setting the tone for uh, for the whole conference by saying <coughs> that their pri the priority of this community is to be as welcoming as possible for uh, for new people. And uh, you know, it was was a bit of a long introduction about how how they they don't want uh, certain situations uh, to happen. Like you know, uh, so sometimes you know, you hear at conferences uh, people get excluded, but they really uh, they really want to include everyone. And they they set the tone for uh, for the whole conference uh, regarding the the community and how how people are going to you know build together uh, Ember and uh, you know and be and be together. Yeah, I think yeah. the two the two rules that they gave were one was if if someone tells you you're making them uncomfortable, just yeah. stop doing that thing that you're doing. Don't don't make it a point of argument or contention with them. Just understand that you're making them uncomfortable. And the other was that if you see someone making someone else uncomfortable, don't presume malice. It might just be they don't have all the facts to hand. And rather than trying to solve situations like this by castigating people and you know, with, with vitriol, just, just engage people in conversation. And so the idea being that, it's that anyone can step into the Ember community and feel confident to say <coughs> what they want. Yeah. Um, and speaking of community, uh, so Leia Silver is on the core team and she organized EmberConf and is sort of behind a lot of the, the marketing drive and the mascots when we need stickers. She sends them um, kind of everything that propels the Ember community forward. She and her, her team are behind that. And I think that's, they made a real point of saying that the people on the core team aren't just the people writing like kernel code and designing APIs. They are 
people doing documentation and release management and com community management and like none of those things stand up individually you've got to have the whole package to have a community working and like I thought that the way they organized it was absolutely amazing yeah yeah they, they absolutely did that. an excellent job I mean it was it was perfect the, the food the, the organization the, the gadgets and everything yeah. <laughs> I got my um, yeah everything was uh, was well, top top Top, uh, top quality, I would say. Yeah, yeah actually, yeah. the food the food was some of the healthiest yeah. and, and tastiest conference food I've ever seen. Yeah. <laughs> and there was like a massive gluten free bar as well, and all this kind of yeah. stuff. Uh, so, the next point is developer happiness. So, the guys addressed it as productivity in the keynote, and I would sort of describe it as the things Paul was saying about um, abstractions that provide a lot for you and what initially seems like magic is really just kind of like getting all the the boilerplate decisions out of the way so that you can just start like running forward with your idea and that's the reason things like the router took you know six months to really come well more than that 18 months to really come together things like query params are taking six months to come together why ember data is still not 1.0 so um, I think that they They've earned the right to congratulate themselves for the fact that once you do grok Ember's abstractions, they let you like get moving really, really quick. I was thinking about Ember as a, a prototyping tool. I don't know if you found this, but I find it amazingly easy to put together quite complex screen, uh, screens and flows just like really, really quickly. Yeah, yeah. For me, for me as well. Like you think about uh, what you can you could do with Rails. Like when, when Rails came out, uh, I think. It was amazing to how, how easy it was to build some some things, but now I think the the standard for web applications got really high. So, for uh, to in order to build these kind of prototypes, very dynamic, with lots of interactions. I think today, if you, if you try to do it with Ember, I mean, for me at least, it's a very ha happy experience. It's uh, it's just I'm very productive. So, I mean, you, you could feel that the people at the conference. They were all sharing this kind of uh, attitude. They were happy to to do to build uh, applications with Ember, and they had high ambitions for uh, yeah. what they wanted to do with their applications. If you um, if you look through the talks, there's one um, I forget the speaker's name right now, but it's uh, he built an app with it called with Ember called Find, and it's a, a UI for the iTunes API, the entire iTunes data set. So it's kind of a totally browser based search interface and like very very like bizarrely quick but you could tell that he he just couldn't help but add more features but because it had become so easy and that stack of routes and controllers and views all those things that ember creates for you means that as you're like gliding along building your application there is always some primitive there to help you like there's there's always a place to put the thing that you need that little bit of logic that you need to go in there or that computed property or whatever it might be so the next point is hard problems, and this kind of ties into the previous one, but it's, um, it's these things that they've spent, that, they've, that they have and continue to agonize over. So the router, right? I mean, we've, I think we both saw it in its early stages. Yeah, early yeah. versions. Do you remember the router when it was uh, just a, a state, like raw state machine? Yeah, basically, yeah. Well, now it's changed quite a lot. Yeah. yeah. Still a state machine under the hood, but now the way you interact with it is you don't have to deal with that if you don't want to. Whereas previously, you would have to describe the whole state machine in all its intricate detail in order to use it. And the um, Ember data really falls into this. Uh, I know uh, Chris Gammy, who we've had to talk here a few times, he, his app is built on that and he enjoys it. But you know, when he hits a snag with it, it's because it's like to solve those problems generally, uh, it's it's super difficult and it takes time and it takes time to put ideas out there and see what happens and then slowly rein them back in again. The, the process of the router was just like this where Alex Machineer spent months gathering people's experiences with the existing router, slowly sort of tugging them all back in, starting to suggest APIs and what might work, starting to feed out betas and it slowly but surely came together until it, it's, it's something now that is inarguably the right tool for the job. Um, good defaults was a theme of the keynote, and 
this sort of is it's kind of like this tri this triptych of developer happiness, hard problems, and good defaults. And the good defaults <coughs> is taking the things that we learn together as a community and encoding them into the framework. So it's not just like you read a blog post about patterns and then you apply those patterns and then the next week you read a different blog post and apply it in, in your same app, apply a bunch of different patterns. The patterns that the Ember community thinks are the best are right there in the framework for you to use. Um, I don't know, like, have there been times when you've been, you've taken something you've learned in Ember and sort of used it elsewhere and found it's, you know, paid dividends or brought to bear? Uh, well, I would say lots of the things that Ember, uh, well, there are not many things that you have to do repeatedly in Ember because usually when you, when you, when you find a problem that you have to do many times, you know, they, they almost uh, always try to incorporate that in the framework. Yeah. Uh, so I would say that the biggest thing that you can take from Ember is actually the, the, the structure that's already there uh, that you can re reuse that kind of, you know, that framework, the yeah. mind framework uh, for building other applications. I think, yeah. I think that's, that's one of the biggest, uh, the, the defaults uh, in the sense of the structure that they built for the uh, for web applications. I think it's the biggest takeaway yeah. to remember. Um, and so the final thing is, well for this slide anyway, is the extensible web. And this isn't, this was kind of the theme of the closing keynote, um, which is, which is to say that Ember and other ambitious web projects right now, Angular and Polymer, taking the ideas from the next generation of the web, things that are still yet to be implemented in browsers and giving them, giving them to us right now, things like ES6 and the idea of promises and uh, bindings and all these, all these things that will be coming built into browsers down the pike, but it's important that we use them to their breaking point right now so that we can figure out if they really are the right tools for the job and the idea being that it takes a project like Ember or Angular or React to disseminate these ideas amongst developers enough that they can all really get using them. So I don't know about you, but like I'd never, never looked at ES6 before, before it popped up in Ember AppKit and before the Ember community started adopting it. Yeah, I, actually I tried Ember AppKit once. Uh, that's one of the biggest in, you know, incentives to, to try Ember AppKit. Uh, but I'm more, actually more excited about what's going to happen with Ember CLI. But yeah, that's one of the, I mean, uh, ES6 modules. And the fact that they won't get components into, into the, the web it's oh, into yeah. the browser itself. Components. That's one of, yeah, that's one of the things that excites me the most about uh, what, what they're going to bring from Ember to the, you know, to the whole web. Or yeah. at least, yeah, from this web, web framework. Oh, that's really that's telling. Cool. The fact that components have proved enormously popular and successful in in all the frameworks in Ember and in, in Angular and like in Polymer is an entirely component uh, focused framework kind of suggests that they are they are what we want. They're what the developer community wants, and so browser you know browser vendors can focus their time on getting that implemented. So that's some sort of takeaways from EmberConf. Um, who, who did you meet? Who were some cool people that you hung out with? Uh, for me, the conference started with a conversation with uh, two Yahoo developers. Mm -hmm. It was pretty interesting to know that basically now they're trying to migrate from YUI. They told me some cool or horror stories about YUI <laughs> and uh, how they're, they're trying uh, now to train 1,200 Ember developers. Basically, all, the whole comp the front end uh, the front-end uh, developers in their company, they're trying to migrate from YUI. And so they were t telling me that the most uh, amazing thing about Ember is that when they have to train someone, uh, it's so easy to get them to up to speed. And once, once they, they learn, they can look at other projects and immediately after like 10 minutes know where are the pieces so they can uh, actually interact. And also one of the things that they said uh, was uh, one of the biggest uh, reasons they chose Ember is that their people that, for example, try to uh, map, you know expose that data with D3, for example, mm -hmm. they could leverage components with, with other by other people. That that was actually one of the yeah, the talks, talks as well, and uh, they they were saying the same thing. So uh, 
that well, was quite interesting to me to well, you know, after that conversation I, I felt oh Amber is pretty big, you know, like yeah. <laughs> it's getting uh, very big so that's uh, uh, that was interesting and also uh, I met uh, I think it was called Chad, uh, the guy that drew the drawings. Oh the yeah, Michael Chan. Michael yeah. Chan, yeah. Uh, yeah, he was also uh, a very cool guy. And yeah. he, did, he did these uh, these drawings of every talk. He would draw some uh, some notes. Yeah, you'll see one of these yeah. later. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, cool. Yeah, no, he he seems very yeah. cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah. For my part, I was lucky enough to end up crashing with a bunch of the guys from the New York scene. So for anyone who who isn't aware. Uh, the Ember meetups in NYC are pretty massive and growing and everyone there is real, really excitable about, about Ember and so I ended up staying with um, Matt Beal and Alex Machineer and a whole bunch of people and um, they hosted a hacker hours in their Airbnb, it was, it was big enough to accommodate about 30 people, it was cool, so a bunch of nerds with laptops, um, Robert Jackson from the core team showed up at one point, so yeah, um, and it's amazingly easy to talk to all of these people. They are super approachable and it really does feel like a big family right now. So, um, first thing I want to talk about with the state of Ember, things that are going on in Ember today, is the release cycle. So, a uh, quick show of hands, Who, who's sort of aware of Ember's release cycle? Okay, cool, that seems like about half the room. So, it's it's based on Chrome's, so the idea being that it's a six-week six release cycle. So um, version 1.5 gets released, and immediately as that happens, the version 1.6 betas start being cut, and then you get a new beta release of 1.6 every week for six weeks until the, so the stable 1.6 goes out there. And the idea is that they've got an idea of the stuff they think is going to go into 1.6, put it out in the betas, some of it will make the cut and some of it won't. So I thought it'd be interesting to just have a look at um, how, like, how that actually plays out. So you see down here where the red arrow is that um, Master gets uh, forked off into a new beta branch, or like Master gets merged into the beta branch. And then you'll see these commits that start to get cherry picked into beta. And uh, this, this is a, a weak marker and Robert Jackson, who's in charge of release management, tagged beta one at this point, and then you see a whole bunch more cherry-picked commits after that, up until a week later when beta two got cut. And it's somewhat automated, but these are the tags in the, and you can see this in his talk, but the tags in the square brackets are to indicate to him and everyone else in the release management team what stuff is supposed to be going into this beta release. So doc beta means I've got a bit of documentation which applies to the stuff that's going into the current beta bug fix beta, you kind of you get the picture and then time progresses, we get to you know get through the weeks beta 4 gets cut um, this is a weird example because you don't, you don't see beta 5 and 6 in here but basically so more more, um, more, bug, more bug fixes, more incremental improvements until finally Beta gets merged into the stable branch, and stable's where stable is where you will just find the the minor releases, the the 1.4, 1.5, 1 1.6, and any uh, security releases that come out. So when it's a 1.5.1, you'll see a stable in there, and that will be like a security commit that gets cherry picked into everything. Yeah, yeah there's the release tags there, and this is all the work of this guy who's newly on the core team. Uh, and he works like a bastard. That's an amazing amount of work to do and to put that system together as well. So, uh, like, <laughs> mad love for him. It's, it's very, very cool. So, um, so I was thinking about the, the release cycle and I think, to me, it's like right now it's one of Ember's crown jewels. And I think the reasons for that that spring to my mind are one that you, you see new features often and you see incremental improvements to the framework often in legitimate releases, not just like, uh, you know, it seems like comparing Ember to Rails, it seems like there's quite a long time relatively between Rails releases, between a Rails, you know, uh, 4.1 and 4.2, it seems like it seems like an eternity compared to what we get with Ember. I don't know whether you'd, you'd yeah, agree yeah, with that. Uh, well, 
uh, yeah, I usually run on Canary, but just because uh, they, they, I think they do a very good job of keeping uh, even Canary pretty stable. Yeah. I mean, I haven't found, at least in my experience building uh, applications, I haven't found any major bugs uh, while, while on Canary. But I definitely, and I definitely think, think that uh, even if you if you stay on the beta the beta channel, it's still you get so many up updates and new features and yeah. things that you can immediately use. Uh, that's definitely, yeah, I agree. Yeah, so, um, so as with Chrome Canary, if you opt into the Ember Canaries, you have, you have access to a bunch of proposed features and you can turn them on, turn them on selectively depending on your needs. Um, and the other thing I was thinking is that it means that like, we as the community can see our contributions in releases really quick. Like you, you are likely to see your work in a legit release of Ember within six weeks. So um, I'm not, a <laughs> I'm not no. a massive contributor, but you know, <coughs> it's cool to know. Uh, so next thing is Ember CLI. Um, there's a talk about this, like <laughs> most of these things. There's a talk about, but this is uh, this is looking really good. Uh, who's used Ember App Kit in the room? So looks like like a quarter, twenty percent, something like that. Um, and has anyone given Ember CLI a go yet? Cool. So it's uh, it's pretty stable. Um, I mean, watch the talk for all the, the really interesting details. There's still bits of it where um, it will sort of generate files for you that have quite a lot of boilerplate in, and I think those will gradually go away. So a bit like when you you know when you do Rails new, you'll just see files with just your stuff in and none of the boilerplate in set up. But I thought I'd um, play a quick video of what it looks like using Ember CLI. So install it, just with npm. So it's going to create that, that sort of scaffold for you, that project skeleton, give you some, some sane choices there to get going with, and then boot the server and you're up and running, and you've got a test suite ready to go, and you've got a build pipeline, and you've got, you've got production setup and minification, and it's all ES6. Um, and though <coughs> on their, um, on the page, it says here, use at your own risk, but really this is a little disingenuous. This is surprisingly stable right now. And like the, the more of us get using it, and get using it in, you know, production or development apps, the more stable it's going to get and the more kinks they're going to be able to work out of it. Do you think you'll migrate anything over to this well, in the immediate future? Yeah, well, I'm a bit of a chicken. I'm still using Rails <laughs> for my Ember apps, uh, global namespace and everything. But uh, I would definitely want to try this for a, you know, a side project or a, yeah. uh, just to... Well, that, that's, that's very exciting. I used Ember App Kit before and I wasn't really... Uh, pleased with the grant pipeline. Mm. That was the biggest uh, thing that discouraged me uh, to use it. But now that this uses broccoli, yeah, uh, yeah, that's that's gonna be amazing. I think. Uh, question. What's the relationship, if there is one, between Ember AppKit and the CLI? So the question was, what's the relationship between Ember AppKit and Ember CLI? And I think, in essence. <laughs> Ember CLI is all the ideas that went into Ember AppKit that kind of baked into something that is more more of like a product and ready to use. A product maybe not the right word, but it's... Um, with Ember AppKit, you could see all the guts of all the decisions that they made, like all, and it, it meant that like upgrading your Ember AppKit setup was quite difficult as they introduced new ideas and figured out new ways to get things to work correctly. And it also meant a hell of a lot of grunt tasks. Just endless grunt tasks. Um, so Ember CLI is the best ideas from Ember AppKit, minus grunt, plus broccoli is the build pipeline. And so you go from, you know, as with, with the grunt pipeline, as your project grew, so your build times would grow as well to, you know, five, six seconds. With Ember CLI and broccoli, your build times stay a constant 200 milliseconds which is kind of a staggering achievement, but we'll, we'll talk about that in, in the, the next topic. Um, any other questions on Ember CLI? How much longer before they actually say this is kind of ready to use? I'd give it, I think, 
I think they'll probably start going into the 1.0 beta phase with it tentatively, I'd say, in the next few months. I think, like with everything else in Ember, they'll stay in that beta phase for quite a while <coughs> because, you know, there's always some edge case lurking in the shadows, and if you've made it impossible for that edge case out the door, then that's a real problem. So I think they need, it still needs to be proven, and when you generate your Ember CLI project, you still do find there are, like I say, there's some bits of boilerplate in there that would be better hidden away so they can be easily upgraded. Actually, there's a nice feature in it where um, you can say Ember uh, subscribe. You, you have a subscribe flag, which will notify you when new releases of Ember in a particular channel you're interested in are available. So, as you're working with your project, if you say subscribe beta, it will ping you a little alert to say, "Hey, you're on beta four. Did you know beta five's just been released?" So, niceties like that are totally possible. It just means like kind of figuring out what the the best starting boilerplate is and how to provide escape hatches to it, and then you know, encoding that. It's back to the same thing again of like codifying those good decisions and moving forward with them. Cool. So um, these are uh, Michael Chan's illustrations that Matteo was talking about. So he did, he did this stuff every single talk, but this is, I thought would be a nice accompaniment, accompaniment to the broccoli talk. Um, do you want to talk a bit about your understanding of broccoli? So we, uh, I should just say that um, Jo Liss isn't here today, but she's one of the co-organisers of Ember London, so maybe a few of you have met her and spoken to her. But um, yeah, I mean, what's, what's your, your take? Yeah, so basically, well, the previous state, uh, the previous build pipeline that uh, we usually used for JavaScript applications was Grunt. But actually, Grunt uh, is, a, is, is more of a task runner. It's not really doesn't really know anything about the structure of files or anything like that. So Joe uh, had, had this idea of you know, making the, the, the structure of files and uh, the pipeline uh, more, more explicit. So, so actually the subject of, uh, of, uh, of the actual build. So she built broccoli that basically uh, only knows about trees. That's why <laughs> the, the trees. Uh, so yeah, so <coughs> what, what happens is you have this Brock file where you can define uh, uh, where, uh, where do you want to take files from and how do you want to process them. So you have that, like these plugins that basically, uh, you know, CoffeeScript or SAS and they, they process your, your trees, which are, which are, for example, I don't know, your vendor folder or your lib folder and they, and they end up uh, and they end up with the uh, final distribution, which is the compiled uh, JavaScript and CSS. So that's the main idea behind Broccoli. Uh, it's it's a very lightweight library. I think it's uh, it's no no more than one thousand lines of code. I think and it's uses, less than that, yeah, yeah, it's very small because it uses uh, mainly plugins to achieve. So the, the the core implementation is very small, and uh, there are lots of and lots of plugins that help you uh, with all your uh, your files, uh, the types of uh, languages that compile to either JavaScript or CSS. Um, so yeah, uh, the, the API surface is compared to Grunt. If you look at a Grunt file, it's it's huge. Instead, if you look at a Brock file, it's pretty small. There's just I don't know if uh, if you have some. Uh, well, I don't have an example. We can show one. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Maybe if there are, if there are questions. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, I'll, I'll echo that. That it's Broccoli's big idea is that a build tool. In, in our world of web development is about taking one or more trees of input files and turning them into an output tree. And so what I mean by that is a bunch of different folders, maybe containing subfolders, and running those through a bunch of different mappings and processes and producing an output folder at the end. And it's complete in, you know, you, you needn't use broccoli with Ember, or in fact you could use it with almost anything you want. But that's that's the principle. It's like take all these different folders that are your input files and turn them into a folder of output files. And both of those things can be thought of as just trees. And yeah, as Matteo said, so you can keep grunt, uh, you can keep grunts. It's a good task runner. Um, pair it with broccoli, and then you've got the best of both worlds. Yeah, yeah it is. 
to the British market. There's a, there's a talk from Joe, it's worth watching. Yeah. Um, has anyone, uh, survey of the room again, who's used broccoli, who's given it a go independently of anything else? Well, you should. It's a really interesting project and it's worth reading the source as well. It's totally intelligible. Okay. Oh, and um, if you want to see all of Michael's illustrations, that's where you can find them. So yeah, there's one for every talk and they're, they're really sweet. So on to testing. So this is kind of big news. Yeah. Uh, for a while, this section of the guides just had that integration tests subsection in it, and it had an, a, a uh, sort of one page worth of rundown on how to do integration tests with the tools that Ember provides. And Ember provides some really nice tools. I mean, do you use them much? Uh, I, I tried to use QUnit at the beginning. Mm -hmm. I was more uh, comfortable uh, with uh, you know, Mocha and, uh, and Chai. Mm -hmm. uh, so I tried to, to use, uh, to migrate to that, that type of library. But I found some difficulties and the guides weren't really, you know, they didn't really tell you uh, how to uh, treat, uh, treat asynchronous things. Yeah. So that, that was one of the main, main problems with, uh, with testing uh, with Ember, like how to actually test Asynchronous behavior, you know, with Ember you, you deal with lots of promises. So um, that's that was one of my main pain points. But I think uh, they they did a very good job uh, yeah. in uh, tackling uh, those problems with the yeah. both the guides and uh, the, uh, the the new library that they built. Yeah. So what you get now with Ember, um, what's the talk? Uh, it's very good. Uh, we've had talks here in London as well about it. You get a bunch of. Um, helpers which allow you to interact with your running application and they will deal with asynchronicity for you and then allow you to perform <laughs> asynchronous assertions. And then there's, because Ember's, Ember, a bit like Angular, has a dependency injection mechanism, you, you tend to find that when you're doing use it, you, uh, use it test, unit tests, you, you will on occasion need some of the dependencies or need to inject mock dependencies and you do that by means of a container. You don't necessarily have to, but it's kind of, it's actually quite comfortable to recreate the container setup in unit tests. And now you can see this here on this slide, uh, model f uh, module for model is part of the Ember Q unit library, which gives you, um, it sort of adds a bunch of extra of these module helpers, which do a bunch of the setup. What this is saying is, I want to write a test about my player model, and player model probably does have some dependencies which it never really works away from. So this will set that up with a bunch of stuff, and then you can, you know, put in your mock dependencies and run with it. But the guides are worth reading front to back. There's some really good stuff there, and they're brand new. They're the efforts of this guy, um, Eric Berry Claus, who has just done like the most amazing work and this is um, this is the pull request this is all this stuff coming together the work of the community to put these guides together and make sure that make sure that people know that Ember does have a good testing story uh, any questions about Ember testing cool so the next thing is the inspector use it much yeah, it's it's one of the best. I think one of the best tools. I use it all every day, and uh, yeah, mainly the uh, roots because you can see uh, this, the state of your application very easily. It's, uh, I think it's one of the best things about Ember. Yeah, as a, as a, in again, show of hands, who's used the Ember Inspector in the room? Cool, that's nearly everyone. It's it's wonderful, and uh, did everyone notice this new feature which? You get the little Tomster in the location bar when you're on an Embry site, which is lovely. And I think one of the, the best new parts of it is the Promises tab. I don't think, oh, I do, I do. So any asynchronous behavior that passes through a promise, you get to see it and inspect it and see what happened to it and what it emitted and whether it got stuck somewhere and whether it swallowed up an error. This is like invaluable in working with an Ember app. Um, actually, yeah, like again, show of hands, has anyone had the situation where you've like, uh, you have a bit of asynchronous functionality and you've hung a then off it and then an error happens, but you just never know, it just disappears. Yeah. Um, this will show you, this will tell you what happened. 
Uh, so Ember Inspector is the work of this guy. And whoop. so he, he also, I think, I hope I've spelled his uh, Twitter handle right there. But um, yeah, he deserves some big props as well. And it's getting better all the time. Oh, and it's available for Firefox as well now. So Firefox and Chrome. So Ember Data, um, use it. Uh, yeah, after, well, I tried to use the 1.0 when the, the first beta 1 came out mm -hmm. and was a bit of a disaster. But I think now that they reached, uh, the latest is I think beta 7. Yeah. It's, pretty, it's pretty stable yeah. and yeah, I, I haven't found any major bugs then. Well, I'm pretty happy with it. Uh, I would say if you have to choose between Ember model and Ember data, uh, going with Ember data is, is a solid choice now. Could you, yeah, could you describe some of the sort of data that you're working with with Ember Data? Uh, well, it's pretty much it's pretty you know uh, it's pretty basic data. Nothing, uh, anything you had in Rails maps ma maps pretty much one one to one mm -hmm. uh, with what I've with what I've got. And uh, yeah, it's it all it has all the common relationships. You know, belong, uh, one to many, many to many. And I found that it's it's really easy to. Uh, maintain relationships, so when something updates, yeah. uh, it knows to re-render the correct stuff. So that's one of the biggest, I think, features uh, that can help you uh, ma manage data yeah. uh, in Ember. Um, yeah, and uh, also one cool thing I, I recently uh, found that it, it got very like very stable is uh, the push payload method. Method. So if you have uh, data coming from web sockets, for example, you have something that uh, it's, it's live uh, coming from pusher. Uh, you just you can just call this method and you can uh, push any payload mm -hmm. uh, that comes from web sockets, and you, it will it will know how to treat it. So e it's not hard anymore to, uh, to to have data coming from other sources other than you know your typical AJAX call. Uh, so that that I found pretty. Pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Rather with Ember model, I found some problems with it. So. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, perhaps the most ambitious part of Ember data has always been modeling of relationships. I was rereading um, the the blog post about the road to Ember data 1.0, and they they make this claim: the two sides of a two-way relationship will remain in sync in Ember data 1.0, regardless of the order records were loaded the way they were loaded or the how or how the relationships were represented in the payloads. And so like you think about how you work with model relationships in Rails and it's it feels very intuitive and the way you describe relationships is intuitive, but you have to remember it's synchronous. And in Ember that's you just don't have that guarantee. You know, your related model could show up at any point in time and change at any point in time. And so there um, their sort of big gamble with this is they, they think they have a way to kind of consolidate all this information about these relationships into a single source of truth. And um, Igor did a very good talk about what's going on with that. That's really worth watching. And it demonstrates what a hard problem it is to solve and to solve in a way that's, that's not just a big mass of spaghetti code which happens to handle all the edge cases, to solve in a way that's actually you know, simple and can be built upon. Um, so they reference this single source of truth branch, which as of today is actually still not merged. I'm not super sure what the state of play with this is. You can see it's um, 33 commits ahead and 284 behind, meaning that those 33 are uh, Igor's work and uh, this guy, H.J. Divad. Um, I'm not sure if they're cherry picking bits from that branch or they're going to merge it in at some point soon, but it's... Um, I think that's where all the really, the sort of, the big fixes surrounding relationships are happening. Um, as Matteo said, we're on beta 7 at the moment and I think they need everyone using these betas and sort of putting it through its paces and doing weird transformations on relationships and using asynchronous relationships as much as possible. Uh, so now, kind of on to the the more forward-looking ones, the ones that are, in theory, just around the corner, but they're kind of the more hypey things. So, HTML bars. Who's who's out of it? Okay, yeah. The the great white whale of HTML bars. It does look fantastic, and it's so worth watching. 
uh, Eric and Chris's t talk on it. Um, I've not, I don't even know how you try it out. Do you have any idea? Uh, no, I don't think there is a, like a, an example or, or anything to you know, guide you. No. But no, there's nothing. No, uh, so there's a repo and you can certainly look at the code and see how it works. I mean, for anyone who doesn't know, it's taking these, the familiar handlebars templates you're used to and rather than turning them into strings which then get inserted into the DOM, it turns them into DOM fragments which can be inserted into the DOM which means we get rid of all those script metamorph tags, they go away and we also get rid of bind atta, don't need that anymore, can just, you know, can do class equals uh, curlies foo, you know, whatever your property is. Um, yeah, so that's these two guys and I think just keep your eyes on them. I think as of now it's mostly with Chris, I think he's trying to bring it on home and but what Eric alluded to in the talk was that HTML bars really encompasses a pretty significant rewrite of the view layer so when it lands later in the year Ember's going to get a lot faster. Yeah, they claim uh, I think like uh, three per three Three uh, times performance. Yeah, three times performance yeah. Uh, improvement for uh, rendering. Yeah. So there is a, a demo of uh, spinning circles. <laughs> yeah. I think <laughs> there is, a, there is a, like a JS pin that shows how how fast uh, Ember is at updating you know lots of stuff on the DOM, and they compare <coughs> it to other libraries. Mm. And currently Ember lags a little bit, yeah. uh, and then they show the HTML bar version and it's super fluid. So yeah, yeah. hopefully. Yeah, it allow be ready soon. Yeah. yeah, I think it, this this work allows them to fix a lot of long-standing problems which have been identified over time, and now they can, they like the path is clear. <laughs> HTML bars is the way, and the other thing that HTML bars is purported to provide is an answer or sort of like a a primitive for server-side rendering. So it's not going to like it's not going to completely solve server-side rendering for you, but it's going to it's going to sort of give a path in that direction. So if you need to, in theory, you'll be able to sort of boot your Ember app in Node, not in Phantom JS or anything like that, not in a real headless browser. You can boot it in Node, plug in HTML bars, which is emitting to a string rather than to a uh, document, and um, you know serve up static HTML that way, which is kind of interesting. And query params new. So we've had Alex Speller come in to talk a couple of times and he, he kind of first, this isn't him, that's Alex Machina. Um Alex Speller did some of the initial work on query params and trying to figure out what the API should be and even what level, what bit of your app is responsible for query params and which bit cares about them. And Alex is the guy that, this Alex Machina is the guy that did all the great work with the router, the router facelift as he called it and he's taken on really solving query parameters and they've ended up as they map onto controller state. Yeah. That's the idea, right? Yeah, that's the idea. Basically, it's, uh, the idea behind it uh, is, is that query params are sort of like a serialization of the app state so that if you, if you can put everything uh, you need in the, in, the, in the root and then you link it to someone and they visit the page, they can actually see the page in the state that it was. So I think the, the debate was whether this should belong in the router or, or in the on the, the controller. And then after thinking about it in a like a serialization for app state, they said okay that, that can belong to the yeah. to the controller. And uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so thing yeah, so things that live in the the bits between the slashes in your URL, roots care about those, those are gonna turn into model data. And then the things in the query params are properties on your controllers. So you know if you've got a, a list of stuff and you can click on the titles and change the sort direction or perform a filter on the data that's already in memory and those kind of things, which you can imagine those just being a, a property on your controller. The idea is you declare with a one-liner that this property is tied to this query parameter and it will just update automatically in both directions. Um, Alex mentioned uh, something he calls model dependent state as well and that's interesting it's the idea that you in Ember your controllers by and large are singletons so they stick around all the time and you set state on them and then when you come back to them that state is still there 
And his notion is sometimes you do want that state to still be there, and sometimes you want that state to be reset if you change the model. Um, <coughs> and right now, I think what we tend to do is do that manually in the root. You just, in setup controller, you would like uh, reset all those bits of state that say stuff like, I don't know, this, this panel is visible or, or not um, each time you load in a new model. And his idea is that you have something akin to a cache key uh, and it sort of interoperates, interoperates with serialization into the URL as well. So what you'd say is basically <laughs> these bits of state um, live in this cache and it could be that the cache is really just what's in the URL at that point in time and if you include the current model its ID say as part of the cache key then inherently when you switch out that model all those properties are going to go back to their defaults <coughs> it's uh, it's a really interesting idea I'm not sure if it'll land with the query param stuff or shortly afterwards but it's worth watching his talk because when he demos it at the end, it really makes a lot more sense than, than I can make of it talking right now, but it will allow interesting stuff in terms of saving some really refined states of the app and states between different models, and it's, it's going to be cool. Um, hey, is there a time frame for that? Yeah. Oh, for the query params? Yeah. He said over the weekend, man, I should really get query params finished this weekend, so I think with enough pressure from the community or maybe people just taking it out of his hands, he might, but I would imagine it's the next major release is one, the next stable release is 1.6, I'd say maybe 1.7 or 8, depending on, because they have those review, those review weekly reviews, yeah. I guess it just depends when he says, this is good to go into beta now, because you can use it in Canary today and see how it behaves but it's not been flagged to go into a beta just yet. Um, I feel like we kind of covered ES6 a bit. I mean, so right now people are using the module loading part of ES6, yeah. but so I know with um, Angular there's a move towards starting to use all of the upcoming ES6 features and it's, is it Tracer, <coughs> the compiler? <coughs> Yeah. I think so. There's a there's yeah. a compiler which will compile ES6 into ES5. Ah, there is a yeah, a, a transpiler. Or yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we, what's in use in the CLI is the module transpiler, which just yeah. knows how to turn the module syntax into stuff that will work with AMD and QuietJS, all that stuff. But then there's all sorts of other cool new stuff in ES6. Um, so I think we'll start to see that becoming part of our regular workflow as well. And it'll, you'll see it popping up, you'll see new transpilers appearing and then people will start using them with MCLI. So, um, in short, the point of this talk is, like, damn, there's a lot happening. There's so much cool stuff and so much forward thinking stuff and I'm sure there's a whole bunch of things I haven't covered. Uh, I wanted to sort of save a bit at the end, but I think I've gone quite long for um, all the cool apps that are out there right now. Maybe uh, as part of a regular thing, we'll try and sort of give some coverage of the new apps that have been, new Ember apps that have been released. Um, I want to give a big shout out to, there's an app called 2B, T-O dot B-E is their domain, and it's this nuts sort of web collage app built with Ember. That's definitely worth a look. Are there any that you uh, I would say, well, Vine is a pretty, pretty cool app. Mm -hmm. It's also built with Ember, and there was a talk about how they solved some problems with the video videos. I think that, that was a very interesting talk. And also, uh, at EmberConf, uh, there was a guy, I remember his name, he presented this uh, iTunes version oh, yeah, with Ember. About, yeah, find. Yeah, find. So uh, if you want to, to check it out, it's, it's pretty cool. The, the, I think the way uh, they used an iTunes unofficial API yeah, and uh, and they built uh, the application uh, with Ember. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'll just show it because it's it's yes. worth a look. Um, without without any server, it just uses Ember data to model. Uh, he said that he had some <laughs> problems with the API because it's not restful at all. Like you ask for movies, you get images or something. But other than that, uh, he, he managed <laughs> to make it work. So 
So this, this has no server-side component of yeah. its own. It talks directly to the iTunes API. And as you can see, it's pretty quick. And one of the things he said about this screen is that, so apps, music, movies, TV, books, each one of those segments, he, he works out just needed to be its own request. So the browser just makes six requests in parallel. And they all come in when they come in, and the page updates because bindings. Yeah. And uh, I guess. Um, he said his motivation was that he got tired of you know that pop up that comes in Chrome that asks you to, to open iTunes. So he tried to uh, to build something that uh, would have some u URLs for applications you know uh, that he wanted to share. So yeah. So I think the interesting part of this. And yeah. He, his lead model. Yeah. He's got. This app, I can't remember quite how it does it, but it automatically generates all these model types based on the data it sees yeah. coming back from the API. So he doesn't, I don't think he predefines this. I think it and its, its unique fields are just kind of inferred from the data that comes down the wire. And he, he yeah. basically rhapsodized about he, how easy it was to do this with Ember. So I, it's one of the best adverts for Ember I can think of at the moment. Yeah. And then um, I'll just show to be really quick. Uh, oh no, this is going to have embarrassing stuff in it. I might. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so the idea, I wonder if I can use it without signing in. So people build mad collages with it and then you can print them out as a t-shirt or you can just invite other people to come in and collaborate with you but the um oh, i can't i'm gonna i'm gonna just have to do the embarrassing thing so the um the big collage you saw at the beginning of this talk was done with this app to be let it load all these people in. So it's like, um, let's see, stencilify. <coughs> it's, it's really kind of cool and impressive and quite bizarre. Like it, it doesn't explain itself too much. It just lets you get on with doing weird stuff. But um, it's again, it's just an Ember app. And you pop it open and you can see it using all the conventions that you're familiar with that uses roots like you'd expect. Don't know if this yeah, this is on uses data as well. I don't know if it was yeah, it's in Captain's and Promises. So this is a really interesting one to look at. And I guess the other big one is um discourse. Ah discourse. Yeah. So uh Discourse, the forum software, open source forum software, built with Rails and Ember. And this is really maturing nicely. Like, it's getting quicker all the time. The mobile view is really good. Um, and again, you can just pop the hood of this and see. They don't use Ember data. They use their own. But they, the guy behind this has built a some sort of performance metric, like Ember performance metrics, which plugs into the inspector. I've not seen that yet, but. Oh, yeah, there was a pull request, I think. Yeah. Rob, Robin Ward. Yeah. yeah. Nice Canadian guy. Um, so, with all that, thank you very much.